Well, good afternoon. Um, I was saying to Tom a few minutes ago that my wife told me in the forecourts they have a tea room for the barristers, and last week as a special concession to the warm weather, they said the barristers may take off their jackets while drinking tea. So um, feel free to relax because the weather is terribly warm. First uh, thing would be just mobile phones can be a nuisance if they go off, uh, perhaps switch them off or turn them to silent. Um, now, Mike's initial address will be on the record and the Q&A afterwards will be off the record. And when we come to that, when you ask questions, we'll ask you to identify yourself. Now, let me say just a few brief words introducing Michael Best. He's Professor Emeritus of Economics at the University of Massachusetts Law, where he was co-director of the Center for Industrial Competitiveness. He held numerous academic fellowships and participated in development projects with the United Nations, the World Bank, and governments in more than 20 countries. Mike really gets around. He is the author of The New Competition, Institutions of Industrial Restructuring, which was published by Harvard University Press in 1990, and of The New Competitive Advantage, The Renewal of American Industry, which was published by Oxford University Press in 2001. Now, Mike's latest book is this, which was published just a few days ago. It's entitled, How Growth Really Happens, The Making of Economic Miracles Through Production, Governance, and Skills. It was published by Princeton University Press last week. Now, earlier today in Seoul, South Korea, this book was formally awarded the prestigious Schumpeter Prize by the International Joseph A. Schumpeter Society. Previous winners of this prize, which is awarded every two years, have included Brian Arthur from Northern Ireland, who will be known to many people, in 1990, Richard Musgrave in 1992, Philippe Agion and Richard Lipsy in 2006, and Kun Lee in 2014. So congratulations, Michael. This honor is richly deserved. <laughs> Michael has had a long engagement with Ireland, starting with lectures in the ESRI and DCU in the early 1990s uh, on his then recently published book. These were organized by Professor David Jacobson. David is responsible for bringing Mike to Ireland or bringing Ireland to Mike's attention. This continued with an invitation by the Northern Ireland Economic Council to give the 1995 Sir Charles Carter Memorial Lecture in Belfast. <laughs> It was followed by his writing of a seminal report on Northern Ireland manufacturing using his evolving capability perspective. And more recently, in 2012, he worked on the economy of the Irish border region and Irish regional policy in path-breaking research carried out for the Centre for Cross-Border Studies. So this is a kind of informal launch of Michael's book in Ireland, an event <clears throat> important since a chapter in it places and interprets Ireland's development strategy alongside other international success stories. The book is available in all book good bookstores and fittingly is priced competitively. <laughs> <laughs> Michael will address us for about 20 to 30 minutes and there will be lots of time for Q&A session. And with respect to the Q&A session, uh, researchers find Chatham House rules rather inappropriate, but these are the rules of the house, and we'd ask you to observe them. Michael. Well, um, of course, thank you for the introduction, John. And uh, John is also co-author of the chapter on, on Ireland, so if the questions get too hard there, John, I hope you do well. Uh, and uh, it's really a thrill to be here. Uh, and uh, yes, you know, John brings up that. I do remember when uh, I, uh, David um, showed up before I knew him, and before he knew me, showed up at my parents' house in Ellensburg, Washington, and, uh, and said, uh, uh, Norm Best uh, was there, and he said, um, Norm, you have the same name as this book I've just been reading, The New Competition. It's a really good book. And so Norm said, well, what do you make of it? I couldn't understand it. And, and he said, it was written by my son. But uh, so in any case, that's when the introduction occurred. 
Now, um, so this is, uh, this is a new book, and I titled it um, The Making of Economic Miracles Through Production, Governance, and Skills, in part because, it, well, if you Google, uh, if you, uh, yeah, if you Google uh, economic miracles, you will, ha you will find about 25 of them uh, in a Wikipedia. So there's all these miracles, and you say, well, why are they called miracles? Uh, and, uh, and the reason I'm afraid that they're called miracles is they haven't yet been explained by, by the regular economic frameworks. So there may be lots and lots of books and many, many articles on uh, the Great Depression and, and Keynesian economics and so on and so forth to do with that. But you will find very, very few around miracles such as that of the Second World War when U.S. output doubled in about a five-year period. And what was the economic policy making there? What are the implications for how we understand how economies work? So, uh, that, so that's what I, I went about to do. Now, examples would be... <clears throat> If you contrast in the 1950s, uh, I don't know if any of you knew, but Greater Boston was in very bad shape. Uh, it was an amazing, amazingly similar in terms of its industrial structure to that of uh, to Manchester. Uh, what I mean is a uh, history of textiles, still textile firms, uh, large employers, still in the 50s. Footwear, uh, the shoe, is it, what is it called? Um, and... Uh, who made most of the, uh, of the machines for shoemaking around the world. And so it, it had those old <coughs> industries. But in the meantime, but the history since then has been wildly different. And uh, when, I, when I read uh, Krugman once, who of course got a uh, Nobel Prize for economic geography and increasing for economic geography, and in his comments, he was never written on, uh, on the Massachusetts, quote, miracle. But he did say something's happened here. There's an amorphous thing going on. We're not sure what it is. Uh, it was a fairly frank assessment of the state of the knowledge. Uh, but um, anyway, I think I've told the story. It's in my book in chapter three, and I won't do it now. Um, but the aircraft industry turns out to be another one where uh, at the, going into the Second World War, the US uh, Air Corps, uh, Army Air Corps, had uh, 800 planes. Um, and when uh, Franklin Roosevelt said in his Arsenal of Democracy speech, uh, uh, which actually didn't occur until 1940, but anyway, he said, um, well, we want to make uh, 50,000 airplanes, like 50,000 a year. And he set another set of targets like that, which said, that can never be done. But by the end of the war, they'd made 300,000 airplanes. And a little anecdote I sort of... Uh, liked is uh, some guys, some pilots shot down over Germany in a B-24 Liberator, and he's, he's shot down, and, uh, and he gets some Germans look at the plane, and they say, geez, this plane is really backward technologically. And the pilot says, yeah, but while we've been talking, we made 25 of them. <laughs> and they could make one B-24 in the biggest factory in the world, Willow Run, they could make it. That whole thing was set up within 19 months, there were, if you can believe this, to make one of those planes, it, it took 1.5 million parts. Nevertheless, they were cranking out these planes one per hour. Think of the supply chain that was involved in that and what they had to build in that supply chain. So I began to realize this, this is a miracle. How they drove through the precision engineering, the synchronization of all of those small, medium-sized companies around the place to be able to do that. At a time when they lost 12 million people, I shouldn't say lost, 12 million people went out of the production sector, well, 12 million people went into armed services, I should say. So the fact of the matter was their labor, they didn't, they, they were, actually had less labor. But the fact, and a big change in who was actually doing the work. So as we all know, women and, many, and people from uh, the agricultural sector came into the labor force. So that was a miracle. Um, now, the thing is, I, 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 the, the, what's really interesting is once you begin thinking this way, you say there was, there was an, there's another economics out there, another economic history, and um, I wanted to originally call the book, uh, let's see, I want to call it, um, I'll go through the happens, the economics you were never taught. But 
Fortunately, the editor at PUP said, that's a, that's a crazy title. And I said, well, that was John's. He said, do that one. I, said, I, I, I agree with you. And it wasn't a good subtitle. But nevertheless, that's what it is. So I present in the book another history altogether. And it does start with, <clears throat> with, um, with Adam Smith as well. Because what's really interesting about Adam Smith, if we're going to look at it from the second approach, I call it the capabilities and innovation paradigm or whatever, that Smith himself did not buy into diminishing returns. Now, it turns out to be really important. And uh, so he was the first of these guys who began to think in terms of this possibility of increasing returns. Now, Smith um, was followed by, um, and this guy is my real hero. I don't know if anyone here can recognize him from his photo. It's terrible, you can't, but if, if anyone's here into the uh, history of the computer, then uh, this is Babbage. And uh, Babbage wrote what I think is one of the most important books ever on economics, uh, and called The Economy of Manufacture and Machinery in 1832. And it was an out and out in many ways. He and his little band of brothers there at Cambridge, uh, UK, he was the Lucasian professor of mathematics, but that's where they came up with this uh, the obser systematic observation approach to doing research. Uh, instead of the axiomatic or a priori, you, you have the great brain and you think it's through and, you know, and so on. They came up with this other approach, which, which uh, the young Darwin attended uh, Babbage's parties and so on, was part of that. And, and uh, I, I won't go on about that, but this guy, Babbage, in order to make his difference engine and his analytical machine, the first real efforts to do the calculators and became computers, he went around to every machine shop in the greater Manchester area as well as everywhere else in order to get enough little factories that could in fact do the, do the machining at the levels of precision required. He was a very good friend of, uh, of, of the uh, Whitworth and so on, the great British engineers at that time. And he was super impressed with what he called mechanical principles, with the, with the brilliant ways in which uh, experiential knowledge, know-how knowledge, existed in, in the hands and the minds of the people who were developing these new machines in the metalworking industries and so on around the, U the UK. But at the same time, he was a scientist who wanted to integrate that with the, the knowledge of why, the science side of it, and the knowledge of what, and so on, the engineering side of it. And, um, and he impressed upon the UK government to, in fact, pursue a, um, a policy of investing heavily <coughs> and integrating all these into a manu into a man what he used the term manufacturing system. And um, <coughs> when I first read him, and I was after I had been using for a long time myself the concept of production system, I thought, oh my God, this is the first time I've seen someone I can, you know, really, really, this is, this is, I just love this, this is fantastic. He laid it out and the idea that you had to get a large investment in the science and technology infrastructure to be able, for Britain was to be able to maintain its leadership in manufacturing at that time. Oh, I've gone on too long there, so I'll put that one shorter. But Alfred Marshall, people don't realize this is the principle of economics, the first book called Principles of Economics. It's got a very, very long, it's got sub books in it, like five sub books in it or something. One of them is on organization. And, uh, and he was a great fan of Darwin. And, uh, and that's what he laid out, this internal and external economies. The external economies is really about increasing, uh, forms of increasing returns and uh, spillovers and knowledge. Uh, uh, Paul Krugman's work, and I respect Paul Krugman enormously, but he says the, the part of the, the, the Marshall Trilogy that we'll go into, we won't look at the know-how part, the spillovers, because they're too hard to measure. So we're going to look at the, uh, the fact that there's a, a, a labor pool a shared labor pool and the fact there's supplier relations. Anyway, it's another story. But he's a major figure. Alan Young actually works on, on dynamic increasing returns. Uh, and uh, then, but here, here's another one of the giants. There's, uh, for me, Babbage is a giant. He's the theorist of production. Then we got Edith Penrose, who writes a theory of the growth of the firm. And from, it's a, it's a classic, and I define by classic. It's a book that everyone knows about, but no one's read. And uh, <coughs> she wrote the, the, great, the great book on the theory of the firm, theory of the growth of the firm. And that's the book which lays out the capabilities perspective and the relationship between technological capability 
And if you got a certain capability, then you are able to identify early on market opportunities. If you then pursue those market opportunities, you increase the, the, cap the skills you have in your workforce. Once you've got them, you're out of balance. You better go look for another product, another market to explore. And so it, it's an absolutely uh, pivotal book. George Richardson put this into, uh, he became an economist who had a falling out with economics, a student of Hicks. So he sold all his books and became the editor, the head of uh, OUP Press. He wrote a brilliant little article on what every firm does is they focus on their core capability and they partner for complementary capabilities. So this is the basis of cluster dynamic processes, um, of cluster dynamic processes. Not clusters, we want to look at innovative networked groups of firms. So he laid out a neat little uh, uh, theory of that. Uh, innovation dynamic. And of course, then here's the great man himself, uh, Schumpeter. And uh, Schumpeter brings many things to the story, but um, <clears throat> the two that I really build on are, he says, look, at, you have to, to understand the economies, you see that there's these bursting influences, but there's also enabling. And, and we're going to see how they fit together, the enabling side of things. People don't realize that. But second, a huge, since he was um, Minister of Finance in the great Austrian uh, inflation, 1930s, he knew all about, he, he, he had this concept of future values, and that, and that uh, the, the, the financial sector was the, was the, he says, it was the headquarters of the capitalist system, the financial sector was, because that does allocations across sectors and so on. And he said, what, what they have to do is, uh, the bankers have to do, is they have, they have to learn to do really serious due diligence so they can figure out where the future values are because those future values won't come online if there isn't heavy investment in those projects. Um, so you can't leave him aside. And, and then, of course, inevitable, uh, here's the theory of the cities, uh, Jane Jacobs. Um, so now we've got, we're doing good. We've got theory of production over there. We've got theory of the firms. And now we've got theory of the growth of cities. And, uh, uh, and then, and then uh, uh, Abramovitz, uh, an assistant economic st statistician to Kuznets during the Second World War. He wrote the first of the growth accounting exercises <coughs> in which he looked at how much did labor contribute to growth in American history and how much did capital contribute to growth. And he came to the conclusion maybe 13%. The rest of it was a measure of our ignorance. Unfortunately, that has become total factor productivity, and any number of people have won Nobel Prizes with macro models in which they just say, this is what the total factor productivity was. This, 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 is, what the, this is what these coefficients were uh, uh, for technology. For, but no theory of technology or theory of technological change or innovation built into it. Um, and um, now, so there's, <clears throat> when miracles occur, there's some kind of leadership always for looking at transformation. And so you'd have to say, the arsenal for democracy, uh, Roosevelt. And uh, if we have Massachusetts Miracle, you'd um, have to say Ralph Flanders. And I'm going to be short on time, so I don't want to go into details. But Flanders ran a machine shop in Vermont. And then he decided he'd run for Congress. Uh, and so he, no, he ran for Senate, became a senator. After a while, he said, I've had enough of this. And he became the head of the Federal Reserve Bank of Boston. He basically almost single-handedly established the financial, the, the, the uniqueness of the Boston financial ecosystem. It's not, a, it's not a, an accident that George Dorio, Dorio invented the concept of venture capital in the greater Boston area, or that the chief economist at the Bank of Boston was in fact a Schumpeterian, or that Flanders' associate in this project was Compton, the head of MIT. Um, but then we come to the German miracle, and Gerhard Erhard, and, uh, Erhard, Celtic Tiger, and I, I could be in trouble here. Uh, you all know more about uh, Mr. Whitaker than I do, but uh, I think in a way, the regime change was what he was about. Let's move away from protectionism onto uh, uh, open markets, and uh, that's gonna have to be the future, the way to go. Uh, production system, the Toyota production system was Mr. Ono. Mr. Ono took just in time from Ford, which he <coughs> said entirely, he says what the Ford system is about, synchronization. And he said, I've learned that from Ford and from American supermarkets, I learned about Kanban. And Kanban was the fact that um, we don't have a planning system to push material through the factory. 
any time there's a shortage of some of, of a product, then the, 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 the person at the shop, uh, work in the supermarket, they replace it. Once it's pulled off, replace it off. So that means it's a pull system of pulling material through the factory rather than a push system through the factory. And that, that keeps a lot of our per production planners from becoming alcoholics or drugs or worse because it can't be done. And, and in addition, uh, many Japanese would say that the thing that most important they ever imported from the United States was the training within industry program. Training within industry program is a way to build, that's what became known as Kaizen, continuous improvement, uh, the quality awards that came out of that, the TQM movement and so on. That was all designed uh, in another, um, uh, during the Second World War US. Socialist market economy and Deng. Uh, he's learned how to, in fact, he's learned from Ireland. How did he learn from Ireland? He learned from Singapore. Singapore learned from Ireland. If you don't have your own science and technology uh, infrastructure, go, go tap into another one somewhere else and use theirs. Deng's been very good about that in, in China with respect to the US. But you do it through foreign direct investment. Makers of economic, then we got the makers. Uh, now, this is Vannevar Bush, <coughs> who created the, um, the U.S. Uh, science and technology infrastructure during the war. MIT had very, very little funding of, uh, of, of, and company development associated with before the war. After the war, it was entirely different. That's why he's on the cover, the scientist who won the war, something like that, of Time magazine. Um, then Kuznets, as I say, the economic statistician who... Uh, <coughs> as I was talking about earlier at the lunchtime, who dictated a, that, the, that the invasion of Europe uh, would occur in 1944 instead of 1943, and he was practically torn apart limb by limb, really. It was a real battle he had over the military planners. He wanted to go in in 43. But he knew that Napoleon was not successful in going east. He knew that Hitler would not be successful in going east if they didn't have a supply network, a supply system in tow. I only wish present UK governors understood the importance of supply networks. In any case, and this, um, this of course, is Sorensen, chief engineer and the real brains behind the Ford system. Um, and uh, this is someone who no one knows but Jesse Jones, who was uh, in, in charge during the interwar period of the Reconstruction Finance Corporation. But if you want to know how these future values were created during the Second World War, the, it was called the Corporation Defense, uh, no, the um, CDC, the Corporation Corporation Defense, no, uh, CDC, anyway, but the Reconstruction Finance Corporation, leave it there, it's in the book, I always trip on it. He, that, they, they invested very, very heavily. The rolling mills that my dad worked in were actually built by the government, funded by the government and so on, sold after the war to Kaiser for a dollar. But anyway, so he was a big thinker. He's there as Roosevelt. This guy is the head of the, of the manpower, the uh, War Manpower Commission, um, McNutt, and he developed and built the training within industry program, which is still the best program ever designed and built for training and training more people and for introducing into the workplace the very ideas that Babbage promoted, which I would think of as the John Lewis model. You better get the people involved who are working in the place and somehow bought into it, otherwise you're not going to be able to make it work. In any case, those are the kind of makers. So we're going to look at, at the three European studies, and uh, three European case studies, <coughs> and uh, I got to say these are probably the ones that are my weakest, but uh, in terms of my personal knowledge, but that's the best thing to do, I think, today. And uh, so the German miracle and the Mittelstand. Now, at the end of the Second World War, um, Germany, well, Germany built the Mittelstand system before German unification and so on, but nevertheless, they, uh, this, this is amazing. So how in the world are you going to build a powerhouse economy when we see, you look at the U.S. model, the U.S. model is these very, very big enterprises, as we know. Um, and, um, and then the Japanese were building these Kaisha, going back to the Zaibatsu and so on. But um, no, they were going to go with the Mittelstand. How do they do it? Now, um, and so I'm going to look at the ways in which they built up uh, extra firm infrastructures in order to convert and reposition the middle stand and turn the middle stand into companies that were entrepreneurial. Then I'm going to look at industrial decline and revival. Industrial decline in the U.S. and many revival, so to speak, and then the Irish uh, tiger. Now, 
If we, and, and, and what I use all the time when I'm thinking about these cases and so on is this capability triad, because I'm convinced from all the success stories around that you've got to think in terms of the interrelationships between the business organization and the business model and, and the production capabilities. You can't say we're going to pursue a strategy of product, uh, developing new products, if you have not thought through on the production capability side what that entails. And it requires a, lot, a whole lot of activities that are not part of production narrowly defined in terms of just getting the, the, the material out the door. So you've got to <coughs> make those connections and with skill formation, those interrelationships. And what happens in, in, in successful industrial strategies is they develop a set of policies that it's as if they are thinking in terms of the capability triad and the nature of those interrelationships. That's, that's uh, the claim. Now, so let's go to Germany and the German miracle then, in the immediate post-war period. Uh, and so these are extra firm infrastructures as economic growth instruments that are the miracle. Now, everyone knows about the dual vocational education system. Again, it goes back to pre-unification of Germany. Uh, the R&D system and innovation process. People know that there's all these uh, Fraunhofer Institutes and Max Planck Institutes and so on. There's development capital. Uh, one of the most important institutions there is KFW, which is a Marshall Plan. Uh, that's, in other words, it went, they could use Marshall hand funding in the very first place. It's still going because it keeps replenishing things, but it focuses entirely on patient capital development. Um, then there's the, the, the terrific, uh, and this is the same as in Massachusetts, uh, the uh, machining subsector, the machining sectors, machining and tooling sectors. If a company is going to do technology management or new product development, they need to have tooling, they need to have machines, they need to have instruments. Uh, Germany has the, probably the biggest sector of, I think of as TIE, tooling, instrument making, uh, equipment making, anything to do with... Uh, with, with getting the tooling. It, things have changed now, because I'm like an old guy now, on <laughs> software tools now, nowadays, of course, but nevertheless. Um, and multi-level government. Now, multi-level government is the pivotal thing here in many, many ways, because as a friend of mine from the Ruhr told me, you know, we were got a huge benefit from the UK uh, from the UK and the US governments to the end of the war when they said that the German state was no longer going to be powerful, no longer going to be running industry, no longer going to be you know, using these cartels to do all the rest of this. So what we're going to do, we're going to demand that the Germans have much, a very decentralized uh, governance structure. So lo and behold, they didn't really realize, of course, what they were doing was creating a new monster uh, in the sense that local government with the power to convene, really critical for the, if you're gonna grow this Mittelstand system and make it good, you can get in the same room, the people who are running the vocational education system, the people who are involved in development capital, the people who are involved in uh, making the, the tooling that's required, the people, <coughs> and, and as well, linkages to the R&D system. So strategic planning goes on at the center of the government, as it does in big multi-divisionals. But, but there's a, a tremendous degree of operational decentralization with respect. And it's really important, because that's where know-how is. That's where things, that's where the makers can operate. And um, so I suggest that each of those infrastructures. So now the British strategy is, uh, now the British strategy is, uh, Gee, we will have uh, infrastructures, uh, a lot of infrastructure, but they never once say relational infrastructures. Or how do we get these unified so that they're all part of a mission of advancing the capabilities of a region's enterprises? And the thing that the German system has done so well is, is it's got balanced regional development. Now, this is pretty hard with Eastern Germany, and we say that's successful entirely yet, <coughs> but nevertheless, it's um, across the whole system that works. Now, when we come to um, uh, Ireland and uh, give a triad success, the Celtic Tiger, as I said before, uh, this was ingenious. I mean, I think it was ingenious. 
and uh, because they fully understood that they didn't have a legacy of uh, engineering, didn't have a legacy of industry for all of the reasons you guys don't know way better than me, and they didn't have a legacy of building companies. So, but what they do across the ocean over there, they got these companies places, which in fact have got a whole set of complementary things going on. And, and if they can, and they say, gee, not a bad idea if we attach ourselves to that capability triad over there. And if they're creating, and because what Boston's very, very good at, early stage technology development. They develop new sectors, those sectors grow fast. But all those big companies, like Boston Scientific, like DEC was, they only, the truth be told, they only employ about, and you're not gonna believe me, but 16 to 17% of their employees in Massachusetts. So a lot of the, this is, this is uh, offshoring without outsourcing this remote management. So if you can build these world-class manufacturing sites and the regional technology colleges around them and the infrastructure that's required of both types, then um, you can, in fact, link into these waves, these technology waves as they come along the line. So race data from analog devices goes there to Limerick, wasn't it? And becomes great friends with the guy running the Regional Technology College. Um, and we get um, Boston, and so DEC is in for a while, and in the very same plant that DEC was in, which creates systems engineering, out of which comes a lot of well-trained engineers, by the way, in, in parts of British, uh, parts of Irish industry. They, uh, that then becomes Boston Scientific, so they do ride the medical device wave. And you know, that was like a, that is a great strategy, and it led to very rapid growth, and everyone knows for a period of time, it was fantastic. Now we got the UK, which is another story altogether. And the UK, a long history of industrial decline. And the fact that there was, from my viewpoint, <coughs> the UK, very, very good design engineering, as we all know, they've never done, ever done, production engineering. Uh, that's not what they do. Uh, and, and, and I'll tell you how I think I, let me, let me tell you a, a, an anecdote uh, that makes the point, I think. Uh, in, in 1985, I wrote a letter to Ian Gibson, who was then the managing director of Nissan up in Sunderland. And I said, Mr. Gibson, uh, I'm down here in London, but I would love to come up and interview on supplier networks. And why it is that Nissan's coming to the UK? Because there's no supplier base left because you know, no automobile industry here anymore. There's Motorsports Valley, but that's another story. And um, he said, yeah, come up. Oh, man, I was on the next train up there. And, uh, and he told me, two, two of the most important things he told me was this one. I said, how, how are you going to build a supplier network here? He says, well, truth is we're not. He says, but um, you know, those guys over there, he points to the room with the Japanese guys, and he says, they think that General Motors is an old sick cow, but Toyota is the, is the global competition for Nissan. And the fact of the matter is we think we can get one up on them because they have a cl closed supplier network. We want an open one. And, and maybe he had different language, I can't remember. But a closed one meant that Toyota designed all of their own stuff and sent it down their supplier's link. And so these guys would then get the designs drawn up at Toyota headquarters. And he says, no, ours is a different one. We think we can tap into Bosch in Germany. Uh, why? Because Bosch supplies Airbus uh, the standards for quality are order of magnitude higher than they are for a car. Uh, they supply Ariane space shots, the uh, standards for miniaturization are order of magnitude higher than they are for Airbus. We can tap into the knowledge base of Europe, use this as a production platform, and that could be a winner for us, V our competition, Toyota. Of course, next week, Toyota comes to town. That is what then rebuilds. That's the revival of the British industry. So for the very first time in British history, there are companies now in Britain who understand uh, mass production, who understand world-class manufacturing, who understand what it means to build a labor force around them, and know they can do it anywhere. And um, they know the principle of interchangeability, the principle of flow, systems integration. They're very good production engineers. Oh, yeah, they're good at it. So then he said, the second thing I really got from him, which was I thought was really interesting, was he says, I, can, I, I see three different types of engineers. 
He said, and he remember, this guy was in charge of a Ford plant in, in Spain before he took charge of that plant, up the Sunderland plant. He said, the, the, the British design engineers are really good, but they're really bored with manufacturing or production. They don't want to do that. They can design new jet engines. You know, they can design this kind of stuff, and, and, but they can't do the rest of this. But he says, the Americans are different. They, they're not that, maybe that great a design engineer, well, they're not bad, but they're more than willing to go through the kind of the prototype, the getting the machining in place, maybe do a prototype. They're kind of bored by the time you're doing pilot projects, and they're out the door by the time you're thinking about production. These Japanese guys, they're different. They do all three. They integrate it really well. They're really pro serious production engineers. And he says, um, they're, they're, they're good at that. Now, where we come to, uh, where we come to, before we get that, where we come to Ireland is, that there's a funny kind of thing. There's kind of a way in which the wrong word is convergence, but there's a way in which the UK stumbled onto the Irish Celtic Tiger industrial policy approach of foreign direct investment to build factories, to build world-class factories. But of course, they never admitted to it. They just saw that as a way to get foreign direct investment into the country. They didn't want to say, oh my god, that's the reason why we've never done industry well here. We've all gone down, down the tubes. So they backed in. Now, of course, they're thinking, well, we don't really probably, you know, we probably, no, no, I don't know what they're thinking now. I'll leave, I'll leave that aside. Um, and, uh, but, uh, 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 anyway, yeah. So then we come to a blind spot. This is the last slide. A blind spot. And, and this was the World Bank Growth Commission did a big major study, which is, they spent, oh, God knows how much money on, in 2008. And the head of it was Michael Spence, a Nobel Prize winner. And, and at the end, they say the following. <clears throat> ah, at a fundamental level, economic development is about the building of individual and institutional capabilities. But, but do not as yet model well. And then, we do not have models that capture the parallel processes of learning and accumulating intangible assets, i.e. extra firm infrastructures, from my view, that go along with measurable capital accumulation and income growth. Um, and so the, the, these guys, I could have told them this. If, if they'd have just picked up my book, The New Competition, they could have saved all that money and they, oh, more than that, they would have had some answers to these questions. I'm oh, sorry about that, but I, I had to include it. My wife said to me, make sure you tell a joke, and I'm not good at jokes, but I try and tell something kind of funny. That was meant to be funny. Yeah, good. Okay, John, I'm through. John. Yeah.